The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to another edition of the Hoop Ball Sacramento Kings podcast. I'm your host, Christian Miller. You can find me on Twitter at my buddy Chris. For all of Hoop Ball's Sacramento Kings coverage on Twitter, it's at Hoop Ball Kings. And for all of your NBA news, NBA fantasy news, and Sacramento Kings coverage, period, it's hoop-ball.com. Go there, get the season pass now if you're playing fantasy basketball. It is a must-have. It gets you access to all that juicy premium content that Hoop Ball puts out. And if you're a new user to DraftKings and deposit $10 there, it gets you the season pass for free. You can find this show on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, as well as the iHeartRadio and HoopBall Radio apps, along with the Dash Radio app. All of those apps available for free to download in the iTunes and Google Play stores. This show is now streaming at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, Monday mornings on the Dash Radio app, the Nothing But Net channel. Nothing but, yeah, Nothing But Net channel. Check us out if you get a chance. And... Hoop Ball is now sponsored by Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company. Go to HawaiianIsles.com or search Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee. Excuse me. HawaiianIsles.com or search Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee on Amazon to get some of their fine product. I had some just a second ago. That's why I feel so bouncy. This show was all about the game in Denver this evening. We recorded it Wednesday night. The travesty that was the two-point loss to the Denver Nuggets. Couldn't get a defensive rebound there at the end to save the Kings' lives. We go into that and more on this episode of the Hoop Ball Sacramento Kings podcast. He is back on the program, Sacramento Kings beat blogger for Hoop Ball, Mr. John Shifley. How are you, sir? Not an awesome night. No, no, I'm, you? I, I'm not doing well either. I unfortunately did not get to see the entirety of, of that ending. It seems like, judging from the score, that the Kings did some miraculous cutting of that lead to make it close right there at the end. Am I correct in that assumption? Miraculous would be overstating it, but uh, they had a good last minute. The two things that really stick out to me at the end of that ball game, the offensive rebounding by the Nuggets was otherworldly. For whatever reason, the Kings were not able to get to the necessary rebounds in order to secure defensive possessions, which is confounding because that has not been the case recently. They have done a good job on the boards. A thing that might have influenced that is Harrison Barnes, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, John, did not come out there for the majority, like I want to say midway through the third until the end of the game, he did not come out. And I don't even think I saw him come out in the second half at all. He played a ton. They, it's, it's almost weird how much they're relying on him, on him early. And it's not necessarily, I don't mean that to say like, he's not that good. I mean that as he just got here. And so, it seems weird to have so much of your game rely on how he plays. And, I mean, they have options. Bogdan Bogdanovich has quietly had a really bad month, but you could play him there. Uh, you could go with Yogi Thurlmore, a backup point guard. I don't really understand why Harrison Barnes is playing 41 minutes. I mean, I guess part of it is they don't feel like they have a good stretch for, but let's get Corey Brewer like five minutes. Let's just see what he has. I don't know. It, it doesn't, he doesn't need to be playing that much so early when he's still trying to figure out, you know, how he's supposed to fit in with the team. But I think the reason why I bring it up that he played as many minutes as he did is probably on some of those possessions, you needed one more guy with the energy to go and get the ball, block somebody out, make something happen. And he just didn't have, did not have that evidenced by that, kind of like rub foul. I don't even know how you'd put it, but on Jokic there right at the end when the Kings did a worry at one of the few times when they were able to get the rebound, he kind of knocked into Jokic and they, he, they caught a cheapie on him there. I mean, that's more so going to happen when you're out of gas. He did play well, but why not go back to Alec Burks? Why not go back to somebody else? 
Bogdanovich had a, the ball in his hands a good amount of the time going down the stretch. And for whatever reason right now, I'm, I'm not feeling as confident about that outcome. There had been, there's been some scuttle, but I can't remember where I heard it from. It might have been in an ESPN column by somebody that I cannot remember at the moment. But when he's been playing with Fox, and maybe you said it, John, that all of this stuff is starting to meld together at this point in the season, that he has not been as effective with Fox on the floor. Seems like that came to fruition here tonight. You're talking about Barnes? I'm talking about Bogdanovich. Oh, yeah. I, I was telling you that yesterday. He's been much worse with Fox on the floor. No, not yesterday. Last time we recorded. And, uh, I mean, he's just been bad for like a month. It's, I don't know. He doesn't, he's not bad defensively, but he doesn't give you a ton there. And recently he's fallen in love with this step back three that he rarely hits. Hasn't really been as much of a playmaker as we saw earlier in the season. And it's weird because a couple of weeks ago he said he was finally starting to feel like himself again after the knee issues. And if anything, this is what I thought he would look like when he first came back. When He, he seemed to come back just fine in November, December, and recently he just – he's kind of lost. He, he tries to take on too much. But getting back to your point with playing Barnes 41 minutes – why wouldn't you play – if you're going to ride anyone to try and win this game, why wouldn't it be Buddy Heald? And why wouldn't you take Buddy Heald, play him 40 minutes? Because we know he is in incredible shape. Right now, just clearly the team's best scorer. And, uh, you know, a guy you really need out there for that many minutes. Um, and you could fill a lot of those minutes with Bogdanovich. Like, Bogdanovich played 26 minutes tonight. Clearly not many of that was at the three because there's no way that you could have him at the three playing, you know, well, if Barnes played 41, he, he obviously didn't play much, but I, I don't get it. I don't get why you wouldn't ride Buddy Heald more. This is a team that's going to expose you if a guy is tired on the other end of the floor, and that's that's really what the, what the Nuggets seemed like they were able to do there at the end. Yeah. Hope everybody's okay out there in the rain. <laughs> What did you think of the Costa sub there with seven minutes to go? I'm a big fan of that kind of thing, bringing in a guy off the bench to give some sort of energy jolt to the guys out on the floor because they definitely needed it there down the stretch. Yeah, especially in Denver. I think that might be an underrated portion of this game, just the fact that the air is thinner. And if you're going to run, which they clearly did tonight, um, it's just going to be a tough night. So having Costa in there just for that reason alone is a pretty good idea. But also the Kings had a lot of trouble with their bigs and just didn't really have the right size. Like uh, Bagley and Giles played some pretty good defense, but they just got taken advantage of on the glass. And uh, that was a big problem for them. I think Costa did a much better job. I actually maybe would have liked to see him a little bit earlier in the game as well. If you're going to keep him on the roster for anything, this is what you kept him on the roster for, a game like this. So, um, you know, this I don't mind seeing him play 10 to 15 minutes tonight. The, I feel like nowadays you can't gas a guy. Like, that guy's got to be in really good shape just because of the way the game is played now. So up and down, especially with this Denver team where you're playing in the altitude and... They're breaking out at every possible chance. Jokic is throwing bombs down the court. You just, you can't do it. And it seemed like a mystery to me. Jaeger has been so good this season playing the strings, playing the, playing this team the way he has. Just, it seemed like a little bit of a misstep there. And it probably cost the Kings one, two, maybe three possessions where they could have gained the upper hand there on the defensive end and just were not able to do so. Getting into the rest of this ball game, they brought the energy early. Early, you're thinking, man, this this is looking good. This is exactly what we wanted to see from this team. The ball movement, the player movement, the kind of flow on offense that was a hallmark early in the season showing up yet again. And in the second half, it just came to a, a crashing halt. Denver scoring outscoring the Kings by 13 in the third quarter. Of course, the Kings making the the comeback there in the fourth. 
What happened, John? <laughs> uh, they just kind of got outplayed. I don't know if there's many ways to say that. They played really well in the first half, and all things considered, it sucks to watch a game like that going into the All-Star break because they really could have used that game. That would have been huge starting this uh, five-game stretch off with a win like that. But um, all things considered, that's really not a bad loss against Denver in Denver. Losing by two, that's just, you know, that's nice for a team that's the eighth seed, and I guess probably now ninth. But uh, it doesn't really make it feel much better, but it certainly is worth keeping in mind that that was a well-played game for the Kings and uh, just so easily could have been a win. I mean, Buddy Heald, it's almost stupid how close he got to hitting that last shot. So, Did you not see that at all? I did see the last shot. That was yeah, that, that was extremely close and just emblematic of the fact that these games are so freaking close by you know inches the Kings win that game. No Gary Harris tonight for the Denver Nuggets. Malone getting ye- or getting tossed. I he deserved it. I, I yeah he deserved it, but I kind of agree with him. Like the refs tonight were not good. There were several several blatant calls that were missed. Throughout the entirety of the game, Paul Millsap walking. There was another one where I, Jokic might have walked. I'm not sure. It looked like walking, but when you slow it down, it, it may not have been the case because there was another instance earlier where nobody made a fuss, and I thought Bagley might have taken an extra step, but it was it was close. I don't. Yeah, they I don't definitely know. missed. Go ahead. They missed steps once, maybe maybe a few times. I would have to rewatch to really see if if what I thought I saw is what I saw, but uh, just generally inconsistent. Even, you know, you take that call that, uh, that Malone got thrown out for. That was a call that I would say is a little ticky tack, but I saw much lighter contact get called throughout the game. And then I saw much, uh, much more obvious contact just kind of get ignored. They just had, there was no consistency to what they were. We're not going to call. And that's, the worst part of it. I mean, you can you can miss calls that's going to happen, but you kind of need to have to call you have to call the game the same the whole way through. Very rare instance where the Kings were getting a lot of foul calls. I can yeah. I can I can count on one hand the amount of times that's happened. That, tonight actually might be the first night, the 57th game of the season. I didn't I don't I don't know. Maybe maybe him getting thrown out had some kind of effect. To me it it didn't really seem like that. If you're the number 2 team in the West, you're going to pick things up in the second second half of ball games and put your foot down and win the games that you absolutely need, which if you're going to be a high seed in the Western Conference is each and every single game. Getting back to Bagley and Giles, I I noticed a little something there in the first half. They seem to be a little more patient and a little more calm there in the post. Bagley, when he gets shut down now, is not completely screwed as far as not knowing what to do or where to go or how to act in that situation. Kept his calm when he got cut off at the baseline. Yogi Ferrell with a nice cut there in the first half. That's good to see. Growth and development from them in what I would call a weakness of their game so far. And then Giles. He's Blocking guys, or not blocking guys, what do you call it? He's getting position. I, I forget what you call it when you, uh, oh, man. Box out? No, not box out. But when you when you get po- post position. Ceiling, that is correct. Giles is ceiling. He's handling the pressure there, not giving in, continuing to fight and fight until he gets a good look at the rim. Do you see growth and development from those guys in, in the post, in the pivot? This was a bad game for Giles, honestly. Um, I thought this was a really good game for Bagley. Bagley had maybe the best pass he's had all season. Uh, the assist he got to Yogi Ferrell. And so, worth noting that he does not make that in November or October. So, it was a nice enough game for him. And... At times, the spacing was frustrating for me. He was he was catching the ball maybe two feet in from the three-point line, and they were giving him space, and he wasn't willing to shoot it. And at that point, if you're not willing to shoot that, you know, 
let's say, 20-foot jumper, and they're giving you the room to do it, then you need to back up more and give your team space. You can't really be standing there and facing up like that if they're going to give you all the space and you won't shoot the ball. Um, and also, you know, beyond needing to back up, which, honest, even if he's willing to shoot it, you do need to back up there and just get behind the line. Um, but I don't know that he has spacing down, and it's it's weird. There have been times recently where he's really willing to shoot, and then there are times where he's not. And tonight we saw that he wasn't that interested in shooting. Um, I don't know if he just didn't feel like he had it or what, but there were times where Bagley spacing did really hurt the team. And then, like I said earlier, they didn't do well on, on the glass. They really let Denver have a lot of offensive rebounds. I would I would guess that a lot of the offensive rebounds came when either Giles or Bagley or both were on the floor. It's a young team. Stuff is going to happen throughout the game. You're going to lose some of these close ones. They have won a lot of close games. De'Aaron Fox is somebody who we were not pointing out or we were not cognizant of, at least I was not cognizant of, watching this game. He was not putting his imprint on things the way you would like, probably having something to do with the fact that Denver's got a lot of length. Their big men have a lot of length. Jokic... And Plumley, I don't know about Millsap, but Millsap's a bit of a presence in there. Early on, it seemed like they wanted to get to the basket. And if you're going to attack the basket, that's going to be the strategy. De'Aaron Fox would seem to be the man to execute it. Was not doing that at all in the second half. Any reason in your mind for that hesitancy on his part? Honestly, Along with Bogdanovich, Fox has kind of quietly not had a great month either. And a lot of that gets back to him not really shooting like he did earlier in the season. And I think a lot of it also gets back to he's not really hitting his floater like he used to. And so he used to be a threat even when they packed the paint against him, which sometimes seems like the only chance you have to stop him when he's really on. He was hitting that floater and kind of making people pay for dropping back on him. And... uh just not really doing that as much anymore. And so I think for both of those guys, the all-star break couldn't have come at a better time. I think they both need some time off to regroup. I would have liked to have seen more deer and Fox there. I would have preferred to have hit the ball in his hands a little bit more, a little too much indecisiveness too from, from both Bogdan Bogdanovich. We've, we've noticed that we've picked it out as a trend here. It, it's happening far too frequently. De'Aaron was having a little too, little bit too much of that. I would have preferred for him to go get the ball. He is the lead dog on the team. Go get the ball. Create something for yourself or somebody else because he is the biggest threat. And when these tight games are coming down the stretch, he's got to be the one to make the pla pass, make the play. I would have liked to have seen more of that. A guy that we yeah. haven't talked a whole lot about, but it has played extremely well. He had a great homestand is Yogi Ferrell. I would say at this point, we can, or at least through this stretch, he is far exceeding the value that he signed for. Would you agree, John Schifferly? Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's, he makes extremely little and isn't even guaranteed for next year, which... I'm pretty certain they're going to pick up that option at this point, but uh, has some value in its own right. So he's played extremely well, and it'll be interesting to see how they handle it because I think he's really earned a lot of minutes with this team. But uh, they're going to want to play Bogdanovich at the backup point guard a little bit. I think this kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier. Barnes playing 41 minutes. Maybe Bogdanovich plays more of the three. You take some of the load off Harrison Barnes. And uh, Yogi Ferrell plays a solid you know, 15 minutes every game, if not more. I, I, I was flummoxed as to why Alec Burks didn't make his way back into the lineup there in the second half. Just give him a blow. You, know? you like Harrison Barnes, but man, if it's... It, it, it just it, it seems like when they do this or when Jaeger goes to the I'm just going to gas a guy, which he hasn't done much this season, it doesn't work out too well. Just give the guy a blow, you know. Can't hurt. Yeah. 
I, I would like to see Burks do, but he kind of, there are some concerns with Burks going forward, mainly the fact that he loves to isolate. And uh, there was, he was flashing that quite a bit early. And so this could have been an uglier game for him than it was. And the fact that he didn't play is maybe what saved him from that. So I don't disagree with keeping Burks out in that second half. I would I would have preferred to see more of him. I was not noticing that in the first half. I I think he's actually done a really good job of assimilating himself. Uh, he and Harrison Barnes Barnes showing that spectacularly tonight. There's yeah we're yeah we're not gonna say or at least according to you, but I have not seen as much of him lately with him being on the Dallas Mavericks. That pass out of out of the post to Buddy Heald for the three pointer. That's like that was impressive. To me, that's all the way across the lane. That That is emblematic of somebody who does have some court vision, can create for other people, and is aware of where they are on the court and where everybody else is. You know, that's that's he, a lot. And for a guy who supposedly cannot create for other people or uh, create assisted baskets, it's quite impressive. He did not make that pass very often in... Uh... In Dallas, I'll say that. Well, all the more reason to to show some improvement. But it, yeah. is he assimilating in the fashion that you expected him to, or I, I'll put it this way: is he is he meeting the expectations that you had as far as assimilating into the team based on or for? I, I can't even get the question out. Take your expectations. Is he fitting? In Is he well? fitting in kind of how you expected? Yeah, he's doing a good job of uh, like he's not in the way, which is big. Your first couple games with the team that you haven't been able to practice with, and uh, has a good awareness of the fact that maybe like you see a lot of the shots he takes are three pointers, and I don't think that's by mistake because a lot of threes are just catch and shoot threes where you're either open or you aren't so take it or don't um so in that sense i think he's doing a good job of like slowly trying to feel it out and decide where where he should be and then also as i mentioned to you his default is clearly to give it to buddy when he's not sure what to do with the ball also he's just looking for buddy like that pass out of the post good job for him to look for clearly the best shooter on the team but in general, when he gets the ball and he's not sure what to do with it, he does kind of just hand it to Buddy and lets Buddy figure it out from there, which is probably the default more guys on this team need to get to. So, um, you know, I think he's done a really good job. Yeah, I mean, one of those yeah. game, one of those games where a little too much of the guys who who are not as hot and not as well. I mean, you're saying that De'Aaron Fox isn't as hot, but Maybe a little more, still, buddy. Maybe maybe a little more, buddy. Healed was needed. Maybe he needed like an additional three or four shots there down the stretch. I don't disagree with riding with Fox though, because he still is. You know, uh, I think Buddy being absolutely out of his mind the last month has put some question on this. But De'Aaron Fox is the best player on the team, so there's no reason to not give. I mean, he's he's at the point where if he's not having a good game, it's still worth getting him the ball and seeing what he's got because he's just so talented. So, Another issue that we have hit on quite frequently, Nemanja Bielica, defensively, uh, for, for whatever reason, is getting pushed around by guys who are his size or smaller in terms of the term that we like to use around here, or at least the Jaeger uses a lot, girth. What is going on there? And I, why it seems to me like he should be a pretty good defensive matchup, or he should be able to guard or handle Paul Millsap down there in the post. Roughly equal size, both talented guys, get down in a stance, provide a little bit of resistance, and he, he did it a little. But far too often, these guys are getting the upper hand on, on Bielitsa off the bat in the, in the first look situation where there really isn't a whole lot of resistance. Yes, there's been a lot of chatter online about playing Bielitsa less and less minutes, especially with Bagley 
having some nice showings, there's still a, uh, a place for Bielitsa in the rotation as they head down the stretch, or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, this was a good game for him. Overall, I I don't disagree. He got 20 minutes, and I don't disagree with that at all. I So roughly what it should have been tonight, you'd say? Uh, he outplayed Giles. I, I, you could convince me that he should have gotten some of Giles' minutes, honestly. Man, it's it's really impressive how Giles picks up those fouls. My goodness. Just left he, and right. Yeah, that's that's really a problem. It's all, mean, it's and, almost like a self-fulfilling or not a, not a well, I mean just as like the fouls get called on him one game and then just they magically happen the next game. And I don't think he's doing a lot of well, I want to say half the time they aren't egregious. Like he's it's ticky-tack type stuff where it seems like he's almost being targeted because he's a rookie. Yeah, I mean Bagley doesn't have that problem. True, but Bag- I, I Bagley's also ma- also typically not matching up against a guy who's in a pivot, or he's doing it less frequently, so we're noticing it less, or it's happening less. Giles has a really bad habit of fouling when he gets beat in any scenario, even sometimes when he's not fully been beat yet. But when a guy gets just like they're going for a rebound and a guy just starts to get good position on him, he'll just start fouling, and that's not something Bagley does. And uh, he's just going to need to pick his spots better. He just has some really dumb fouls. I, I'm already concerned. I, I, I've stated my concern, actually, and I am now concerned that he may not be able to. Because I don't think as you age and given the, the injury history that he's already got, I, you know, I don't know if the the defense, the necessary defensive positioning and acumen that you need in order to be successful down there in the paint to protect the basket is going to eventually arrive. Is that a concern of yours? Do you think that it, he is young and that will eventually bubble to the surface? See, I've actually been pretty impressed with a lot of his defense to this point. What? I, Wait, I like whoa, what whoa, 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 whoa. Have yeah. I... I think I've been listening to what you've been saying on these podcasts yeah. because I ha- I'd have to in order to make educated responses. Uh, I I had yeah. not picked that up. He has a big problem with fouling, um, but overall he has pretty quick hands. He's active. I really like a lot of his fundamentals, and like he gets in a good defensive stance. He moves his feet pretty well. Uh, he's not the best vertical athlete, but he challenges a lot of shots. Um, there's a lot to like with him defensively. He just needs to be a, a smarter defender in terms of not fouling, which is, it's a problem that a lot of guys have. I mean, Jokic was horrible about fouls that first year he was really breaking out. And even before that, so it's something that players have to learn and he'll learn it as well. But, uh, I mean, hopefully he can kind of make some progress there soon because they really could use him in the playoffs. But overall, defensively, I'm not too worried about him. I think his ultimate, like what he's going to become is really tied to how much can he develop as a passer. And, you know, does does he's pretty good out of the post, and I think he makes some good reads off the dribble, but it would be interesting to see how much he's going to develop his face-up game and how much he's going to be able to pass when he faces up. And how much does the shot come along? But the defense, I think, is going to it's going to be there enough for him to have a good career. The lack of lateral defensive quickness is highly concerning to me. Like there, there are far too many scenarios where he's having to play defense on a guard who's gotten into the lane, gotten past his guy, coming off the screen, whatever the case may be, and he's just not there. You're you're not noticing that. I actually. I kind of like his lateral quickness, honestly. Okay, we we yeah. we're we're gonna have to agree to disagree and and come to come back to this most certainly at a later date. Those Denver Nuggets, by the way, are stacked. That's gonna be it. They are gonna be a tough team in the playoffs. Yeah, they are. They like, really are. Like just... they just my god. Like they didn't even have Gary Harris tonight. You've got Isaiah coming back. If he starts to look like even eighty five percent of what he was in that. 2017 season along with Monte Morris and, and Jamal Murray has been revelatory 
along with Jokic. And Plumlee's really good. Like, I now understand why they gave him a multi-year eight-figure deal. Because he's he's got the length, and he's got a little bit more of a, a broad, more broad offensive game than I was expecting. Is that would he, Did we just see that as a one-time thing where he was targeting the Kings, or is that truly part of his game? Uh, he's going to take advantage of teams that don't have a lot of size. And so that was part of it. I think Bagley defended him well, and he just hit some nice shots. But he's basically Jokic, but not as good at any part of what Jokic does. Because he can pass a little bit. He's pretty big. Uh, and I think that's why the... I, I think I've actually seen someone write about this, that they like him because he can come in and basically replicate what Jokic does. Maybe not as well, but they can run a lot of offense through him, you know, all that stuff. So he's not bad. Um, the two guys that really stood out to me tonight were Tory Craig is really good. That guy can really play defense. Um, and then Malik Beasley, it's just... I hate to bring it up now. I was gonna bring it up a week ago. Hold on. Are you gonna are you gonna bring up a draft miss by the no. Kings? Okay, good. Thank you. I'm gonna bring up kind of something like that. Um, <laughs> Malik Beasley did not find minutes for years on the Nuggets, and you know this year he's been huge for them. He's been, I think they mentioned it on the broadcast. He's averaging almost 20 points per game over the last like 10 games or something. Uh, incredible athlete, just kind of had to put it together until this season. And uh, that's the reason why I don't think the Kings should have gotten rid of Scal. I would have given him another offseason and just seen what he does next season, especially because if Willie Cauley-Stein gets a nice offer sheet, Costa Kufis gets a nice offer this offseason, um, you're pretty much down to, at that point, Bagley, Martin Bagley, and Harry Giles, Giles and uh, yeah, yeah. Nemanja Bjelica. Yeah. You need another big. Are you but that's funny because you've been pounding the pavement or the table, whatever people pound, about the Kings not needing a backup big man or at least not needing an excess of them. Scout would have been the fourth big man. We were seeing where Bielitsa wasn't able to, or they didn't play Bielitsa for long stretches of that second half there because they thought he was a bad defensive matchup. Scal, yes, his defensive numbers are pretty good. Dude, is, is he really needed as a fourth big? And when he didn't already, when he wasn't getting minutes, does he really want to stick around here and? see if he actually can vault the two guys who it seems like the organization is more behind rather than go with the fresh start somewhere else. Well, the two problems with that are, one, he's under contract whether he likes it or not next season for like a million dollars. So, like, he's not hurting your books. He's not – he can't leave even if he wants to. Um, and then – the other thing is, I don't think they necessarily need another backup big, but if they do bring in a backup big, it needs to be someone who can shoot, and Scal clearly can. And, you know, Bagley, I think, is a nice weak side room protector. I don't know that he quite has the length, or at least the instincts, to be a primary room protector at this point. And Giles doesn't get off the floor all that well, so he's not really providing you much there either. Like they both put a lot of pressure on guys coming in to shoot, but um, you know, Scal showed that he could block shots and he played hard. I think he fit in with what the team was doing and they traded him for someone who's six foot nine and 250 pounds that, you know, what's Caleb Swanigan ever going to be? I don't, I don't understand why people aren't bringing that up. He's, he can't play defense and he can't shoot 40% from the field. At least Scal could shoot. At least Scal blocks shots sometimes. Um, I hope for the best from Caleb Swanigan, but uh, yeah. Well, wow. maybe Vlade Divac will prove you wrong. Caleb's, Caleb, Sw really Caleb Swanigan will, will be on the court there throwing dimes. Dropping dimes, throwing down dunks, the whole bit. 
that's going to do it. I think I think we've pretty much covered it. Is there anything else in particular that you want to get off your chest before we get on out of here? Uh, no, no. Fantastic. Well, that is is going to do it for us. He is John Shriffle. You can find him on Twitter at John Shriffle. You can find me on Twitter at my buddy Chris for all of Hoopball's Sacramento Kings coverage on Twitter. It's at Hoopball Kings. And for all of your NBA news, NBA fantasy news, and Sacramento Kings coverage, period, it's hoop-ball.com. Go there, get the season pass now if you're playing fantasy basketball. It's a must-have. And if you're a new user to DraftKings and deposit $10 there, it gets you the season pass for free. You can find this show on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, as well as the iHeartRadio and Hoopball Radio apps, which are available for free to download in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Along with the Dash Radio app, our show is streaming 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, every Monday morning on the Nothing But Net channel of Dash Radio. And Hoopball is sponsored now by Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company. Go to HawaiianIsles.com or search Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee to get some of their fine product and follow them on Twitter at HI Kona Coffee. He is John Shifley, and for John Shifley, I'm Christian Villery saying, see you next time. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.